Well, good morning, all. Good to see you on this Labor Day weekend. So the last time I preached on this text was exactly, well, more or less exactly, three years ago on a Sunday, the last time that, uh, that this passage came up in the lectionary, being on uh, a three-year cycle of readings as we are. And the place I preached that Sunday three years ago was actually here at St. Mark's, although I was not on staff at the time. I was a guest, uh, and we were still in the pandemic days, of course, so my sermon uh, was delivered live at the 9 o'clock three years ago, but otherwise uh, to an empty church, to a camera in an empty church, along with Father Justin, who was celebrating that day. Now then, as now, I was presented with a difficult choice between two fantastic scriptural passages, scriptural stories, the first one being of Moses at the burning bush, and the second one being the time that Jesus calls St. Peter Satan. (laughs) How to choose? Well, the first time, the decision seemed to be made for me when I was driving down from Kent, Connecticut, where I worked and lived at the time, at Kent School, to New Canaan in the days before I was to preach this sermon, and I found myself behind a truck. Apologies for those who saw this and remembered uh, when I told the story last time, but I was behind a truck, and it had written on it, uh, before you cut me off, and that is, the just picture this, the letter B, the number four, uh, the letter U, before you cut me off, see Matthew sixteen twenty three. Well, does anybody know what Matthew 16, 23 is? It is, get behind me, Satan. So that was the trucker's message to those behind him, or her. Um, I don't know how many people got it, but of course I did, and uh, uh, preached accordingly. Now this time, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I will talk about that gospel. I will also talk about the Moses story And I will talk about another verse, not in the lectionary, but that I saw on the back of another truck just a few days ago. I'll get to that one later. Uh, And the reason I'm trying to weave all this together is that, as Reverend Elizabeth said at the beginning of our service today, we are beginning our observance of what we're calling a season of creation care from the beginning of, of this month, September, until October 8th, when we will join with Christians around the world in uh, spotlighting our relationship with creation and our, cre- our relationship with our creator through the creation. Uh, the intent is to renew these relationships, to deepen them. And I think these two passages that we have today, along with the one that I saw in the truck a few days ago, uh, together can speak powerfully to our proper relationship to our creator and to all creation and how to, uh, how to foster those relationships. In the Gospel of Matthew, the verse referenced on the truck I saw three years ago is, of course, spoken by Jesus to Peter. And the setup for this is that Jesus, as we hear at the beginning of the passage, for the very first time is starting to talk to his disciples about how he is going to suffer and die before being raised again. This comes right after, if you recall the passage that Reverend Elizabeth preached on last week, comes right after... uh, Peter saying to Jesus, you are the Messiah, and Jesus praising Peter for this confession. So, though we are accustomed to the idea that Jesus as the Messiah was crucified and rose again, it cannot be overstated just how jarring this would have been for Peter and the rest of Jesus' disciples to hear, this idea that their Messiah, the Messiah, would suffer and die. The Messiah long awaited by Jews of Jesus' time, was widely expected to be a triumphant liberator, even a warrior king, to improve the material, the political circumstances of the Jewish people. And so the Messiah was certainly not expected to suffer and to die. After all, he was supposed to be a winner, not a loser. And if you got crucified by the Roman Empire, you're kind of a loser by any conventional measure. So we can understand why, after Jesus starts talking about all this, Peter objects. He takes Jesus aside. He says, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. Well, of course he feels this way. So what does Jesus do? He turns away from him, literally like turns his back on Peter, if Peter's like right there, and says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. 
Now, this is just one shocking statement from Jesus after another. First, the Messiah says, I'm going to die. And then he calls his foremost disciple, as Matthew depicts him, Satan. Now, Satan, after all, is the devil, the evil one, the tempter. In Hebrew, the word means opponent. Why would Jesus call Peter, the foremost of his disciples, Satan? Well, earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, we have the story of Jesus fasting in the wilderness before he begins his work. And we have Satan appearing to him in the wilderness, tempting him, trying to divert Jesus from his vocation, from his mission. So Peter, however well-intentioned in this story, is kind of doing the same thing. He is a stumbling block, as Jesus says, along his path of following the way that God is calling him to go. Jesus here goes on to name the cause of Peter's error in judgment here. He says to him, you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus seems to be saying that Peter's perspective here is limited. That however reasonable and understandable it might be, after all, he just doesn't want his rabbi to be killed, uh, Peter is missing the big picture. Even with faith, I think for all of us, it's so often hard to see the big picture, to see as God sees, to think as God thinks. St. Augustine once wrote, When I first knew you, God, you made me see that there was something to see, and yet I was not yet able to see it. Now, perhaps the biggest limiting factor to our perspective, and to Peter's perspective, is our egocentricity. That part of us that's always thinking in terms of I, me, and mine, like that George Harrison Beatles song, you know, all through the day, I, me, mine, I, me, mine, I, me, mine. Right? I mean, how many of our thoughts throughout any given day are about I, me, and mine? My life, my plans, my car, my phone, etc. Right? Uh, it's very understandable. It's very human. But there are dangers in it. And it tends to distort our view of reality because we're really not the center of the world. We might be the center of our perspective of the world, but we're not actually the center. And following Jesus is about connecting with reality, connecting with truth. And the truth is that we are simply not the center of things. When we live in this egocentric manner, when we think and feel and act in this way, our primary concerns tend to be ones of self-preservation, security, self-protection. It makes ourselves fixated on our place in the world. And this tends toward a life that is dominated by fear, fear of threats to our frightened and fragile little ego. And as Master Yoda said in The Empire Strikes Back, fear is the path to the dark side. I think Jesus saw this. And so Jesus says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Think here, Jesus is calling us to deny our egocentricity, indeed to put our egocentricity to death in some way. This is, of course, not a call to destroy our ego. It's not a call to destroy our sense of self. That's not, I think, what Jesus is talking about. Rather, he's calling us to put our ego in its proper place. So we can be liberated from the fear and the suffering we create for ourselves and for others and for all the world when we have ourselves in the center of our reality. Jesus came to set us free from this. He came to be our liberator, not in the way that Peter expected, not with a sword, not as a warrior, but in a much deeper, spiritual sort of way. So how do we follow Jesus on this path to freedom? Well, only the grace of God can really transform us in this way. But we can cooperate, and indeed we must cooperate, if we really want the freedom that Jesus is offering. Now Moses, in today's passage, I think models two ways we can open ourselves up to God's transforming work. The first way is seen in the fact that Moses is alone in the story. He's with his flock. He's a shepherd at this stage of his life. 
but he is alone as far as human companionship and human distraction goes. And solitude is vital for our relationship with God, for our ability to perceive God. We need to set aside time away from the voices, the judgments, and demands of others. And this, of course, includes our phones, which is a difficult thing to do. But when we are truly in solitude, we can sit still, settle down, pray, meditate. We can engage in a contemplative, centering, creative activity. Or like Moses, we can wander in the wilderness. And that brings me to the second way that Moses shows us how to come into a deeper contact with God. Moses is, of course, in nature in this story. It says that he is in the wilderness. In fact, the text says he has gone beyond the wilderness. I didn't know you could go beyond the wilderness, but that's where he is going. He has left civilization behind. Reverend Elizabeth gave a profound sermon a few months ago on Earth Day weekend about the importance of experiencing awe in nature and how true and important this is. Nature has a power to reorient us, to reconnect us with creation and with our own true nature. Because very often we go through life feeling like an isolated ego trapped in our bodies. More specifically, we feel like we are located somewhere between our ears and behind our eyes, looking out on a world that is strange and foreign to us. There's a poem that goes, I, a stranger and afraid in a world I never made. And how true is this of, of our feelings about ourselves and our world so much of the time? Now, our conventions of language reveal this. So often when people talk about their birth, they say, I came into the world on such and such a date and such and such a place. As if we were something foreign to the world that at some point was dropped into it, like from the stork or something. But of course, this is not true. And we didn't come into the world. We, we really came out of the world. We are like apples on an apple tree. We are earthlings, after all. The first name, or the name of the first human in the Bible is Adam, and this comes from the Hebrew word Adama, which simply means soil and earth. So the biblical view of human beings is that we are earthlings, growths, of, growths out of the earth. And therefore, we're part of the world. We are in communion with it, whether or not we recognize it. In some real sense, we are the world looking out upon itself. We forget this for so many reasons, uh, one of which being that our bodies are not rooted to the earth like trees are, but nonetheless, we are no less a part of nature than a tree is. But of course, the difference is we can and do forget about this. And then we think, feel, and act in ways that are totally contrary to this reality that lead us to do violence to ourselves and to others and to the creation. And so we need to get into nature regularly to be reminded, to remember, to reconnect. And when we reconnect with the natural world, we might also encounter our Creator, as Moses does. When Moses is in the wilderness, God appears to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. The bush was bla blazing, yet it was not consumed. Now this sort of appearance in the Bible is known as a theophany, an appearance of a deity, which is what the Greek word literally means. And these sorts of appearances occur throughout the Bible. We have this story, we have the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire in the Exodus narrative. We have God appearing to the Israelites on Mount Sinai. We have the prophets, uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel, having visions. We have the annunciation by the angel Gabriel to Mary that she will conceive and bear a son named Jesus. We have the appearance of angels to the shepherds in the field when Jesus is born. We have the Holy Spirit appearing as a dove at Jesus' baptism. And of course, we have the transfiguration of Jesus with the appearances of, of Moses and Elijah and the cloud uh, speaking to, to Peter and James and John, which we talked about a few weeks ago. Now, these appearances of God often take place in the natural world, or at least in humble, kind of rural settings. Now, Bede Griffiths, uh, an English monk and priest of the last century, wrote about this phenomenon in his spiritual autobiography. He grew up secular, but as a student became first very enthralled with, uh, by philosophy and then with spirituality and poetry and literature, all of which sort of led him on and on to, to faith. And part of this path for him, 
path for him was leaving his studies at Oxford and going to live in a very small village in the Cotswolds in England. And there he read the Bible with, with new eyes and was drawn deeper into a life of faith and found himself open to the stories in the Bible, including the supernatural stories in the Bible, in a whole new way. And speaking about the Annunciation to Mary, he wrote that it was difficult to imagine the Annunciation taking place in London or Birmingham any more than in any of the great cities of the Roman Empire. It had taken place in a remote village among the hills of Galilee, and I found no difficulty in believing that it might have taken place in one of our Cotswold villages. I think we can say something similar about the Exodus story, that we need to get away from civilization, away from the world that we have built up that is so full of our pride and presumption, and get into solitude, get into nature, into humble and simple surroundings to really connect with God. We might not encounter something as extraordinary as a burning bush, though you never know, but in the natural world we might perceive the reality and nearness of God in other ways, through experiences of awe, of wonder, of beauty, harmony. We need the natural world to see God in this way. And so for this, and for so many other reasons, we really need to protect the earth. This one planet that God has made to be our common home. Now back to the other Bible verse that I referenced, uh, I saw a reference on the truck last week. It said, only Jesus saves, Acts 4.12. Now Acts 4.12 reads, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now, this verse was spoken by Peter, unlike the verse I saw in a truck three years ago, which is speak, spoken to Peter. Now, I don't know what the person who wrote this on their truck had in mind, but to me, it reminds me of, of the many signs I've seen, and I'm sure all of us have seen on billboards, yard signs, etc., that say something to the effect of, you must believe in Jesus if you want to be saved. And I think this is very much of a piece with what we can call evacuation theology that what the gospel is really about is going to heaven, getting souls into heaven after death, which makes this world and care for this world quite secondary, if not totally irrelevant. But is that really what the message is? Is that what Jesus is talking about? Is that what Peter is talking about? Well, if you put this passage in context, Peter is, of course, living and teaching in the, the world of the Roman Empire. And in that world, salvation was often attributed to the emperor. The emperor, Caesar, was hailed as emperor, or hailed as savior and as God. And the idea was that the salvation that the emperor brings is to the world, that the emperor brings peace and justice and so on. So Peter here is saying that salvation comes from Jesus not from the emperor, not from any other earthly power. But this is not salvation from the world. This is the salvation of the world, ourselves and all creation included. Jesus' message and mission is not primarily about getting souls into heaven after we die. Rather, as he says in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. I think that's what it's about. So let's take Jesus' warnings about the dangers of egocentricity to heart and the ways that they can distort our relationship with ourselves and with others and with all creation. And let's follow Moses into the wilderness and into a deeper communion with God so that like Moses and like Jesus and like Peter, we might join in extending the salvation that comes from God to the ends of the world, the natural world and all creation included. Amen.